Hi everyone, welcome to the first uh, Smart Grid Seminar of this quarter. Our speaker today is Professor John Birch from the University of Chicago. And you talk about how to increase uh, electricity market efficiency with flexible mechanisms. And uh, before we start, I would like to go through some of these basic instructions for this webinar. Uh, which I think are particularly useful for those who are attending this seminar for the first time. Uh, now on your, uh, now everyone will be muted upon entry, so that to reduce background noise. And there are a few features uh, on your screen that would be that you can use to communicate with the speaker and the, and and the panel. Um, there's this check feature. Uh, if you have any, if you encounter any technical difficulties, such as uh, you cannot hear the speaker, you can use that to, to let us know. And there is this raise hand uh, feature. Uh, you can use use that to if you if you need a simple question to be clarified, for example, a the, the definition or something like that. And uh, if you have any in-depth questions, you should save it to the. You should use the Q and A feature. And those questions will be answered after the at the end of the of, of the seminar. Now I would like to. Uh, no, this is a schedule for this quarter. There will be five seminars, and I would like to remind you that the the next seminar is in two weeks, and the speaker is uh, Manini Batanu from VMware. Charlie, I will let you introduce the speaker. Uh, th thank you very much, Chen Wu. Um, it's, uh, you know, my name is uh, Charlie Kolstad. I'm the faculty co-director of Bits and Watts, and uh, welcome to the uh, Smart Grid Seminar for the, for the fall. Um, it's my pleasure today and privilege to introduce a distinguished Stanford alumnus uh, Professor John Burge of the University of Chicago. Uh, John's specialty is mathematical modeling of systems under uncertainty, and particularly stochastic programming and large-scale optimization. Uh, this is an area relevant to my research in economics and highly relevant for so many uh, modern problems. As signs of his stature in the profession, John is the editor-in-chief of the journal Operations Research and was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. John received his, his PhD in 1980 from the legendary Stanford Operations Research Department, which is now part of MSNE. He went on to a career at the University of Michigan, Northwestern, and now the University of Chicago. At Northwestern, he was Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. We're lucky to have John Burge with us, sort of with us, today speaking on the highly relevant topic of increasing electric, electricity market efficiency with flexible mechanisms. John, I'll turn things over to you. Great, thanks, Charlie. Okay. Now let me share my screen. And open that up. All right, great. Well, thank you, Charlie, for the introduction and uh, for inviting me. Um, it's great to be virtually at Stanford. Um, I usually like to, when I go to Stanford, I usually like to go for a run around the dish. Um, so I didn't, didn't get a chance to do that today, um, but, I, I, but I thought about it while I was uh, doing my morning jog. Um, I wanna thank you all for coming. What, what I'll be talking about is increasing um, market efficiency um, with different kinds of mechanisms, so I'll call them flexible mechanisms. Um, you can think of this as being somewhat synonymous with increasing renewable uh, penetration. Um, for the most part, renewables have very low marginal costs, and I'll be basically talking about marginal costs. Um, so when I talk about efficiency, um, even though it's minimizing costs or minimizing um, resources. 
uh, you can also think about it in terms of uh, renewables, and I'll, I'll mention that as we go, as we go through. Um, a lot of this is joint work with uh, colleagues at Wisconsin, as well as um, also at the University of Chicago, uh, Bernie LeSouter, Lena Rolt, and Victor Zavala um, in Madison, and then Andrew Chen, my colleague in computer science, and Arn Upsur, who's a postdoc with me. Um, okay, so. Uh, the big theme of what I'm going to talk about is that uh, electricity forward and spot markets are very complicated things. Um, there are things like startup costs and minimum run levels and times, um, all of which make operating these markets uh, quite complex. Uh, there's also a great deal of uncertainty. Um, there's uncertainty in demand, for example, it depends a lot on the weather. Um, there's also uncertainty in supply and particularly with renewables, um, wind and solar in, in terms of uh, how much they're gonna be providing. Uh, and the way markets are set up now, uh, there are inherent inefficiencies and that uncertainty in the supply and the intermittency uh, makes those inefficiencies, I think, even more salient and uh, perhaps even greater. Uh, but there are ways in which you can redesign these markets that can increase the consistency, um, making incentives for efficiency, and uh, that you can do that by allowing some kinds of flexibility. So that's the basic bottom line of what I want to get to. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll go through, talk a little bit about re renewable sources and uh, their impact. I'll give you, if you're not familiar with the way most of the markets in the world work, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of how these markets work. And uh, then I'll talk about some of the issues in terms of uh, market power, which you can think of as not being efficient. Um, issues that arise because of these fixed costs, which create non-convexities, um, which markets have some difficulty dealing with. Um, and then a particular property of the way markets are operated today, which uh, means that you can never match both prices and quantities in the right way, the way you'd like to, um, and uh, that there lack uh, there are, uh, there is a lack of incentives um, for things that might be good for the market, like pooling or like relocating demand. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk about uh, ways to resolve it. Um, as Charlie mentioned in my introduction, a lot of what I do is, is stochastic optimization, stochastic programming. Um, so it's not surprising that I'll talk about how stochastic programming can help um, resolving these, um, but it requires some additional mechanisms and I'll talk about those in terms of flexible bids and integration of markets. In particular here, I mean the market for energy and uh, the market for transmission. Okay, so um, you've probably all seen uh, something about uh, the growth of wind and solar um, it's probably around 1,500 gigawatts globally right now. Um, to put that in perspective, the U.S. has capacity of around 1,100 gigawatts. Uh, so the amount of global wind and solar power is effectively greater um, than total U.S. electric power generation capability. Um, and you can see that it's... Uh, been predominantly wind, um, but solar has been increasing at a very high rate uh, somewhat recently. Um, and now wind and solar globally have about the same uh, installed capacity. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's highly variable. I just took a snapshot here from MISO, which is the mid-continent independent system operator. Um, which operates in the central part of North America from Manitoba at the north to Louisiana in the south. Um, and MISO has a lot of wind capacity, 
uh, but it's highly variable. Uh, so this is a snapshot several years ago. It's even more so now since the MISO has uh, increased its wind generation capabilities quite significantly. Um, but you see fluctuations that are basically, you know, from less than a thousand uh, megawatts available to uh, to ten thousand. Um, so uh, and in very short amounts of time, these are hours down down here. Um, so in very very short amounts of time, um, you see wide fluctuations in terms of uh, wind variability. Um, solar, same thing. It's uh, variable, um, obviously, uh, there's not too much solar uh, production at night, um, but even during the day, uh, there's, there can be very high variability um, in total uh, solar availability, depending on uh, particular weather conditions. Um, so uh, so solar, solar and wind both have um, high variability, um, that sort of led in California um, to this uh, sort of the famous duck curve. And I, I took um, an example from um, just August of this year when, when you had, um, uh, I think the highest uh, net demand for this year, although it's, it's actually much lower than it was um, several years ago. Um, but here's the, this, the green curve is the total net demand and uh, the uh, purple curve down here, it, or the total demand is, is, is uh, what's here in green. Um, and then the, the lower curve is the net demand after I take out uh, the solar uh, generation. And uh, as you would imagine, as solar generation goes, when the sun sets, um, here's some time um, around seven o'clock, it looks like it was around seven or eight o'clock um, on that day, um, these two have to match. And uh, I guess there's a little bit of wind, so we probably have some wind in here as well. Um, so uh, what that means is there has to be this ramping up of uh, generation in order to be able to match these, these two curves uh, at, at this point in time, once the sun sets. Um, and that's what that required a ramping rate of uh, 9,000 megawatts um, in three hours here on, on that day um, in August. Um, so it's, it's a, a big challenge. Um, it's even more of a challenge because this is an aggregate, uh, but, uh, but the grid actually is a network. Um, and that means that in some places the grid, we have to ramp up very, very rapidly, but there's, um, there may not be any generation capability there. We may not be able to get uh, the generation from one spot to another. And that can lead to really wide variation in the prices um, across uh, different regions. And I'll show some examples here. Just as, these are examples actually just from today. I thought I'd just take a snapshot. This is the price of electricity in, the, in two parts of the MISO grid. Um, here, this is, uh, this is Iowa and uh, Illinois and Missouri. Um, and here, this is along the border between, um, it looks like Minneapolis or uh, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, and you see why variation in prices in very close proximity uh, locations. Uh, so here, uh, for example, and this, this was persisting a lot today, I'm not sure exactly why, um, but here this, this location had uh, a price of $105 per megawatt hour. Um, and the, this location over here at a price of minus $30 per megawatt hour. Now you might wonder why, uh, why is electricity selling at a price of minus $30 per megawatt hour? Well, $30 per megawatt hour is about uh, what is earned on the production tax um, 
regulation that allows you to recoup um, taxes uh, by providing wind power. Um, and so uh, by taking that production tax credit, um, which amounts to about $30 a megawatt hour, um, it's still profitable to be producing even though there's actually no place for the generation to go. Uh, so these wind farms, there's a wind farm located here. Uh, these wind farms are, um, are generating power um, just to, to get the production tax credit. It's not productive in, in any means. I mean, um, you could earn money just by parking a truck full of um, electric toasters here um, and getting paid $30 per megawatt hour um, for what you were producing or for what you were consuming. Um, and uh, that's not a very, uh, not a very effective use. Now I'm not, I'm not going to talk about, um, about that specifically, um, but what I would like to talk about are ways in which we can try to eliminate this kind of inefficiency um, so that, uh, you know, we don't have uh, circumstances like this where a distance of uh, only about 20 miles um, has price differences that are more than $100 um, a megawatt hour. And, and we have either what we call stranded power or um, negative prices. Um, either you could just sort of spill the wind, um, uh, not, not generate uh, any power, or you generate power and have negative prices. Um, and that's a function of, of the network. Um, so uh, the question is, how, how can we come up with uh, some mechanisms? Um, but before I, I, I talk about the mechanisms to try to address uh, these problems, I th thought I'd go through and talk a little bit about how uh, these markets are constructed. So let's uh, talk about this. If you know everything about the electricity market, um, I apologize, um, but I'll, I'll try to go through and give everybody uh, somewhat of an introduction. Um, so in most places, it's about 60% uh, of North America, um, most, of the, uh, most of Europe, um, many other um, countries around the world, um, South America, um, Asia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, have something called an um, independent system operator. Um, at the, that example of those prices was this independent sy system operator called MISO or Midcontinent. Um, and they coordinate the, uh, the use of the transmission system, basically the, the use of the network, um, and they provide service to the customers, uh, customers being both uh, consumers um, as well as uh, industrial customers, um, and, uh, and then securing the power from the generators. Um, so they run this wholesale market for energy, uh, for distributors usually here buying um, electricity uh, from uh, the generators, but going through uh, the independent system operator as operating uh, the market. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the role of transmission in this, but, um, but basically the, the independent system operator is uh, organizing the use of these transmission lines um, and deciding what generators are gonna be generating and how much, uh, and, and ensuring that there's enough uh, generation for um, each of the consumers that's um, associated with the network. Okay, so um, so the participants in the network are the in the market are the generators and uh, what uh, in electricity is usually called the load entities or the demand. Those would be the, the consumers or the distributors. Um, and there are also financial participants and the financial participants are there as a, a means to try to lessen the potential market power that either the generators or the load entities might, uh, might try to exercise. Uh, 
the way the market works is that the buyers and sellers submit bids. Uh, the bid is both a quantity and a price, um, either to buy or sell, depending on which side of the market you're on, um, at particular nodes or locations uh, along the network. And the independent system operator clears the market by considering these bids, but also uh, considering the capacity of the transmission network, uh, as well as the energy that's lost uh, in transmission. Uh, the, the energy loss in transmission is not, not very great, um, but the independent system operator still has to consider that and basically balancing the market. Uh, but because of the transmission network, it's, it's not just a, a matter of uh, summing up the supply and the demand, make sure they're finding out where they cross. Um, they have to solve an optimization model actually to, uh, to make these determinations because of all the constraints from uh, the transmission. And then they come up with prices. Uh, the prices, uh, if you're familiar with these optimization models, they're basically the Lagrange multipliers in the optimization model. Um, and they are the marginal costs of supplying electricity um, uh, an additional amount of electricity at, at each location. Um, and as I said, in my zone in particular, the, many of the transmission lines are congested and you, you get these, these wide variations in prices. Um, so the, the way the market works is there, there are two instantiations. There's a forward market, which is called the day ahead market because it operates 24 hours in advance. Um, and that schedules everything. And it, it basically tells uh, the generators, oh, we want you to produce tomorrow. Um, and so what that means is the generators are then able to start up their plants since many of the plants um, require some time before the, the thermal generators in particular, um, require some time to be able to, to actually get to full generation capacity. Um, and then in the real-time market, they make adjustments. Uh, so there's a, a real-time market to make adjustments and, um, and then the day ahead market to, to make commitments. It's also called unit commitment. Um, ideally, what should happen is that the day ahead market has prices that are the expected value of what you would see in the real-time market um, and that the only thing that the real-time market is doing is adjusting um, in real time. Um, the idea of having the day ahead market is because it's cheaper if you've planned exactly when these plants are gonna be operating, um, that it's less expensive if you can plan on it in advance. Um, However, because of the network, the congestion in the network actually creates areas in which a single producer or a single consumer, um, but in particular in, the, in these networks, producers, uh, a single producer actually can exercise market power and affect what the price is. Um, and in fact, there's a big incentive for generators uh, to withhold the amount that they put into that market in the day ahead um, relative to the real time. And I'll just show you um, basically what that means. Um, so here's the quantity say that they're offering that's on this Y axis. And here might be the price that they would receive in the market. And this, uh, what I call the residual demand curve here, this, this line, that I call the residual demand curve represents what price they would receive if they produced a, or offered a given quantity. Um, well, they have an incentive to offer a lower quantity. So this, this red line here corresponds to a lower quantity in the day ahead market. And then what they'll receive in the day ahead market is this price that's here. So they'll receive a high, high price in the day ahead market. Um, however, they're actually able to produce a lot more, but they're only offering this, this smaller quantity in the day ahead market. And what they can do is then later in the real-time market, 
they offer a higher quantity. And now they'll receive this different price <coughs> in the real-time market, um, in addition to what they, they received in the, in the um, day ahead market. So by offering this additional, this additional quantity, they'll receive this price, and they'll be able to get this amount of revenue. Um, so they'll get their revenue from the day ahead market plus extra revenue um, from the real-time market um, and so there's an incentive, uh, again, for them to withhold in the, in the day ahead market, get a higher price, and then um, have uh, higher quantities in the real-time market when the real-time market has lower prices. Now, we might, you might wonder, well, can that really persist if everyone's, uh, if they're not able to exercise market power, um, then this, uh, this advantage should go away and these two prices should end up the same. Um, but what we see is actually they, they don't. Uh, this is uh, the cumulative difference between day ahead price and uh, real time price in the MISO market. Um, again, this was uh, some years ago. Um, before they changed their, their market rules. Um, but uh, effectively what this says is if you sold power um, in the day ahead market, got the high price and bought it back in the real time market, you would make the difference in these two, between those two prices and your portfolio would be growing like this curve. Um, if this, if this was something like a stock investment, I think it has um, a, a sharp ratio of something like 150, where the market generally has a sharp ratio of 0.4. Um, so this, uh, this was, it looks like kind of a no lose uh, bet if you could enter into these markets. And in fact, there was a way to enter in these markets. They, allowed financial participation. So uh, a pure financial participant in this market should have been able to realize a curve like this. And as I said, it's like an investment with this enormous return relative to very little risk. Um, uh, so that seems like um, almost, uh, well, it seems like too good to be true. Um, if this money is sort of sitting on the table, why aren't people entering into this market? Um, uh, yeah, so as I, as I said, the, um, what you might expect is maybe the, the, the uh, consumer side, the, the demand side should be adjusting um, their load, but they're often, they're often regulated um, and they have steep penalties if they don't meet the demand. In other words, they're representing consumers like retail consumers. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, there may be very high, high penalties if they're not able to meet the demand. So, uh, so there's little uh, effect in terms of actual physical uh, adjustments in terms of demand. Um, but as I said, there are these financial bidders. Uh, they could enter uh, the market, either on the demand or the supply side. Um, and it seems like uh, what they should be doing is entering on the supply side. In other words, trying to sell electricity at the high price in the day ahead market, and then uh, buying it back in the real time market and making that difference um, as I showed in that curve. Um, However, uh, I'll just I'll mention this now and then, then I'll, I'll talk about why it's problematic. Not only can they enter the energy market, there's another market for transmission and the transmission market behaves a little bit differently. Um, but let's look at what actually happened with uh, these markets. What I show here are the number of bids that were placed by virtual bidders, by these financial traders, 
either on the supply side or on the demand side. So the blue dots correspond to the number of bids on the supply side, or the, the amount that's bid on the supply side. And the red dots correspond to the amounts that are bid on the demand side um, over, this, over that same period of time. So as I said, what, what we might think should happen is that people should be bidding supply in other words, getting paid in the day ahead market and then buying back um, in the real time market, but instead they're doing the opposite. The, the red dots are a lot higher than the, than the blue dots. And it looks like the financial participants are doing the opposite of what would be expected to try to make this market more efficient and decrease the market power um, of these generators. Um, okay, so, so the first thing is to try to understand why, why this might be going on. Um, and the, at least uh, to some extent, I think it's explained by uh, what are called financial transmission rights. So as I said, there's this other market uh, for transmission. And it's usually represented here by these financial transmission rights. And what this financial transmission right, let's say for a line that can, uh, has a capacity of 100 megawatts. Uh, when, you, when you own that right or when, when you buy it, uh, then you're paid the difference in the prices between the two locations because the um, MISO is collecting um, additional funds um, in place A, but it's paying for it maybe through the transmission in place B. Um, so MISO is collecting this additional amount and um, the independent system operator is. Um, and this owning the transmission rights means that you, you receive that, that difference. Um, So let's, let's imagine a situation in which the transmission is binding and let's say the prices are in A are $20 megawatt hour and in B uh, they're $30 megawatt hour. Um, but we expect the real time prices to be lower. So we, we would expect uh, someone to try to offer additional supply here to, that would bring price down to try to take advantage of that, let's say that $30 to $28 swing at, in place B. Um, but instead what happens is we see an additional demand bid at, at B. So in other words, someone says, well, I'd, I'd like to purchase additional power at B. Well, as you purchase additional power, that's going to require another resource, which has, is more expensive and that raises the price so let's say that raised the price um, from $30 megawatt hour to, to $40 megawatt hour. What that means is the owner of the financial transmission right now earns an additional $40 at B compared to $30 at B. Um, and they earn it on all 100 of the megawatts of transmission that they have the right for. Um, so they'll earn an additional $1,000 that bid only loses on this one megawatt. Um, what you lose on the bid is the difference between the real time price and the day ahead price. Um, so they lose $12, um, but they gain $1,000. Uh, so uh, there's a huge incentive then uh, for the virtual traders uh, to try to manipulate the energy market because of their investments that they have in the transmission market. So uh, the fact that these marks are not integrated is, is again, one of the issues that creates some kind of inefficiency. Um, uh, the other thing that happens is this, uh, what, well, what can happen because of that is uh, that in the day market, we, we have commitment 
um, and the commitment involves minimum run times um, uh, and uh, having to deal with uh, turning units on and off. Um, so you, you'd like to run that, that uh, initial auction in such a way that uh, that's done in um, an optimal manner. Um, but if there are these additional uh, forces that are increasing demand artificially, say, um, that can lead to inefficiency by having more generators on. Um, uh, the other thing it leads to is uh, non-convexity, and I'll just mention that briefly. And this is a little example of, say, three generators. Uh, here's generator one. Every time I turn it on, it costs 50. This one costs 300. This one costs 100. Um, these two have some minimum run capability, so may, many thermogenerators have to run it at some minimum level, and then they have some maximum level, um, and then different costs that are associated with it. Um, because of that, here I, I'm showing as you increase the amount of generation, um, what's the total cost, and then what's the marginal cost. And what happens is that the marginal cost actually changes substantially. So you have high marginal costs, then low, as another generator comes on, um, then maybe it goes back to high for the next one, uh, then low again as an, as an additional generator comes on. And then it has these uh, periods in which it can go from uh, very low to very high and back again. There are ways in which we might be able to get around it. I've sort of drawn in a possible way here. Um, but uh, uh, in general, uh, this um, um, has these, these uh, non-monotonic uh, issues, um, which also can create inefficiencies. Um, in this case, uh, the marginal costs themselves might not cover all of the cost for production, and so there have to be some sort of charges that are spread through the market. And so the market has to adjust um, by having additional charges um, for everybody who's generating. Um, and there's additional incentives for, um, for generators to exercise market power, to, to reduce their outputs so that they can increase their marginal costs and increase, increase the marginal costs and then increase um, the amount that they receive from the market. Um, now, the other issue which uh, I want to try to deal with is that there is a lot of uncertainty um, associated with supply, as I said, um, it's also associated with demand. So if I think of the residual demand as like uh, the load minus whatever is provided by the renewables, um, it turns out there's, there's absolutely no way that this day ahead market that's just based on uh, bids and then run like uh, traditional auction, assuming that production will be exactly equal to those quantities. Um, there's no way that that market actually can reproduce uh, what will happen in terms of both price and quantity. Uh, because uh, the, the price, the marginal cost basically is convex. It's, or it's increasing as the generation or the output increases, um, that means that if I look at the price as a function of the quantity, it's this convex curve here. Um, when I fix the quantity and look at the expected price, it's gonna be higher than whatever is right along the curve. So the, the way the market is cleared is gonna be along, let's say that blue line, um, but the expectation is somewhere inside, this is inside the convex hull of that blue line. It's somewhere inside. And so if I try to match the quantity, the expected price is always gonna be higher than whatever I have in, let's say the day ahead market. If I try to match the expected price, um, then the quantity will be higher than whatever I have in the day ahead market. Um, so these, uh, these markets actually can never match both the price and quantity. Um, and the main reason for having them was that we wanted to have sufficient quantity 
uh, if we end up um, matching on price, well, we'll have sufficient, but we're, we're actually gonna be paying for more than, than we actually need. If we try to match in terms of quantity, uh, then the price is gonna be lower uh, than, uh, than what it should be. Um, and that's not gonna get um, enough people to, to supply. Um, so there's, there's additional kinds of inefficiency because of this uncertainty. Uh, so this is just repeating what I said. The nonlinearity in the cost implies that matching these expected prices and quantities is just not possible. And these deterministic models can't do it. Um, so we can include that. And as I said, that's uh, the kind of thing that I've done in, in my work. Um, uh, to actually run the process, assuming that there are generators like wind and solar, which are going to be random and assuming that I can um, represent that randomness effectively, then I, we, can run, um, we can run that auction uh, with this uncertainty actually included into it. Um, and then the other thing is to allow some kind of flexibility um, particularly for certain kinds of loads, such as data centers. Uh, so da data centers are actually represent um, a large amount of load. In some places, it can be about 5%. Um, globally, it's maybe 1% or 2% of all electric power consumption. Um, and that basically can be done anywhere. Um, a lot of it, for example, gets done um, above the Arctic Circle. Um, particularly for mining uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, but, uh, but there are many data centers that are uh, performing tasks for uh, like Google and Amazon or Facebook um, that uh, are located in um, the main grid. Um, but those tasks can be performed uh, virtually anywhere and sometimes they can be performed at different times. Uh, so the load can be shifted. Uh, so allowing flexibility and shifting that load actually can improve these markets substantially as well. Um, and then the, the third uh, point is to, to integrate it so that we don't have that incentive to try to manipulate one market to um, um, receive additional profits in another. Okay, so I'll just mention about uh, the stochastic unit commitment. This is something I've worked on for quite a while. Um, you can uh, uh, solve these models somewhat efficiently now, um, at least um, to the extent that uh, could be used in, in these um, bidding processes. Um, they require generation of many scenarios. Um, we can, you know, fairly uh, robust ways to generate scenarios, not, not exactly, it's hard to predict wind in a, very specific location where there's a, a wind turbine, um, but, uh, but we can generate many scenarios of what the wind might be in, in different locations. Um, this is the way these models are set up. I minimize the total costs, includes the fuel, the startup, any penalties if I'm not able to actually meet the load. Um, I balance the load, balance it, or make sure that I don't exceed the transmission. Um, respect uh, the physics um, uh, and um, make sure that uh, I stay within the limits of all the different generations. Um, this is mathematically what it would look like. Um, here are some wind scenarios. As I'll just show you this. And this is for a small example using one of the uh, toy grids um, that's available. Um, turning on different generators um, and then allowing uh, randomness in the, the wind that's being generated. Um, and then looking at the effect. Now I'm going to look at the effect actually of doing this two ways. Um, one is how much is it worth if I was able to precisely predict um, the actual wind generation. Um, and here it, it's worth something in this little mo model. It's, it's sort of 500 out of a total of uh, 60,000. Um, it's not very much, about one, less than 1%. Um, but it's certainly, certainly a value to know something about the future. Um, 
But what's interesting is, is this other concept, which I have coined as the value of a stochastic solution, which is how much is it worth to solve this stochastic model versus the deterministic model that's, that's used today. Um, and that value is actually a little bit more than 1%. Um, uh, so, something like one or close to one and a half percent. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's actually quite substantial. If you could save one and a half percent just doing this, um, that certainly that's, it's worth the computational cost. Um, so one, one of the efficiencies could just be um, just including this model, just how, what, what, how much is the model worth? It's, it's worth substantially. Um, and now what happens if I also include these, these flexible loads? And um, uh, in this case, let's say I have this data center and it could bid in, in one of two locations, either A or B. Let's say there's a load in A, a load in B, there's a transmission capacity between A and B. Um, but I'll, I'll allow the uh, data provider uh, to say, well, I'd like to get this served, this delta, um, but you, the, the ISO, can determine where to place that, uh, place that load. So it could either be over here. So if the wind, let's say the wind is concentrated in A, but A has higher costs, um, or it could be over here. If I allow that load actually um, to be flexible, um, then we can get sort of substantial savings. So the way I've worked it out here, if I did the fixed bids, this would be the cost. Um, if I include uncertainty and include, um, the flexible bids, um, then I get this cost here. The gain is I, I don't need to turn on that expensive plant that was in part A. Um, I get some marginal advantage over whatever the minimum run uh, capacity was um, for the generator in region A. Um, and I get additional amounts of wind that I couldn't have used before because I was limited by the transmission um, as well as uh, um, having uh, already this minimum run capability for the, the generator in A. Um, so the, the load um, at A can, can help share the savings and actually it reduces, it reduces cost, but it also reduces um, carbon emissions because I'm able to use up all the wind, whereas I, I wouldn't have been able um, to use all the wind um, if I didn't have this. Um, so uh, these incentives um, can include some kind of sharing so that there's an incentive, there's an additional incentive um, for uh, like the data center providers to, to offer flexible loads. Um, the, the uncertainty, um, we can, can try to ensure that those resources again, don't, um, don't try to exercise market power in any way. Um, by uh, saying that they face penalties, for example, they have some charges if they are not able to produce um, what, they, what they bid into the market. Um, and I could also include similar charges for those who enter into this market and impose some kind of additional costs on the financial transmission market. Um, so by including surcharges for those as well, um, I can I can even increase the amount that um, I get <clears throat> in terms of efficiency. Um, uh, so there there are many things about making this actually work in practice, um, particularly if a if a generator like wind generator has additional uh, information that the ISO doesn't have. Um, how can we ensure that it's incentive compatible for the generator to provide that information? Um, how can we determine exactly how these these savings might be shared um, by having these flexible bids? Um, how uh, this could even be greater if you could share across ISOs, and particularly because a lot of these data centers uh, they don't they're not physically restricted really in in any manner, um, and so uh, you if you were able to go um, across ISOs. 
um, throughout North America or not e even in North America uh, outside, um, how would you be able to, to share um, to, to make this even more capable? Um, and um, how can we test this? Uh, but, uh, so I haven't, haven't done empirical testing. I, that's one of the things I'm quite interested in, in trying to be able to do. Um, so uh, to summarize, uh, electricity markets present a lot of challenges. Um, the current market designs uh, create some efficient inefficiencies. Um, and by explicitly including uncertainty in these flexible bids and integrated markets, um, these inf inefficiencies can be eliminated and we can increase uh, the use of renewable resources. Okay, so thank you uh, for your attention and hopefully I'll have time for a couple of questions. So put, put your questions in the Q&A. There is uh, already one question there. Yeah. Can you see, uh, John, can you see it? I do. Okay. Can you see it, John? Yes, okay. It's uh, when you discuss the effects of transmission cans constraints. This is your slide where you have the negative uh, $50 for wind or never negative 30 next to a hundred dollar price. Oh yeah, is this a situation where there's no transmission line? Yeah, so, uh, so effectively there is transmission. The problem is it's all, all congested. Uh, so at, so what's happening is where the electricity is being generated, it's already using up all of the uh, transmission and you're not able to get additional power um, into that location where the price was spiking um, more than $100 uh, a megawatt hour. Okay, let's see. Uh, oh, what would be the impact? Um, yeah, I, I think it's possible. Uh, like my, my little toy example was something like, um, you know, one, one percent. Um, I think the total cost impact could be two percent, which is um, something in excess of a hundred billion dollars a year. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, and that, that'll be in the United States. Um, uh, so, yeah, the impact I think could be, um, something like 2% maybe of, uh, total electric power costs. Um, and, but, a, but a bigger impact in terms of renewables. Um, so something in the order of 10%. Uh, maybe uh, greater renewable usage. Um, okay, next was, uh, don't we expect a day ahead real-time premium due to risk aversion? Yeah, uh, um, yeah, so uh, there, is, there, there is a little bit of risk aversion. And, and actually, when I started to look at that, I thought, oh, that must be it. Um, it, it must be risk aversion that's, that's causing this, but the differences are so huge. It was $2 over a day. And uh, to have that level of risk aversion, um, you know, which was something like 10%, um, it, it just didn't make it, it, it didn't make any sense at all. Um, so it, um, it, it really can't be easily explained by, by risk aversion. Um, uh, so the uh, fundamental role of FDR is hedging against congestion um, uh, that people often lose on FDRs doesn't seem surprising. Can you explain how this is evidence of market power? Um, so uh, the, the evidence of market power is more about, um, about how those, uh, the day ahead prices are being pushed in the opposite direction from real-time prices, um, and uh, and how that's benefiting the people with financial transmission rights. 
um, we, in a study, I have a paper that talks about this um, with uh, Ignacio Mercadal and Ali Hortachu and Mike Pavlin. And um, you know, what we found in looking at the MISO data uh, are some of these examples where actually um, uh, the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, um, actually did discover that, that people were, were doing this uh, deliberately. Um, so that paper goes into um, about uh, kind of the evidence for this. Um, uh, what goes into the model? Okay, so the, the, um, the generation scenarios that I showed, um, those are, those were predictions from models from Argonne, um, from some of my colleagues at Argonne National Laboratories. Um, now they're very precise. So they, uh, they will um, model wind conditions uh, within, you know, w w w in sort of the few square meter uh, kind of areas so that they can get precise wind condition predictions um, at different points in time, um, exactly at a wind turbine. Um, and they then they generate these, uh, these scenarios. So, um, so the, those were scenarios that were generated by that, uh, um, that those, by that Argon model. Um, uh, can an FDR be synthesized? Uh, you could the, the, uh, by uh, buying and selling power in different locations with uh, virtual bits. Uh, and uh, thank you, Bob, for the question. Um, uh, so uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, uh, yeah, that it's possible, but you have to, you'd have to leverage to the, uh, to the total capacity of the FTR, um, which is which is uh, yeah, difficult to do. So it it's um, uh, because the price is uh, changing in a nonlinear manner. Um, that's that's a little bit harder to do. Um, and then the next one, um, if power generation forecasts include information on their own uncertainty, could that be useful in classifying um, by magnitude of certainty? Yeah, so um, yeah, that's uh, kind of what I was alluding to at the end. Um, how can you extract that uncertainty and what uh, the wind uh, generators might, uh, might, be, might be considering? Um, I mean, they, they know something about local conditions that, uh, that the ISO might might not know, um, and that could be a value. So, uh, yes, that could help in terms of uh, in terms of classification here. Okay. Well, I don't know if we have a the ability to have an applause canned applause here, but. We should. Um, I want to thank you very much. Well, thank, uh, thank you, Charlie. Thank, thank you, everyone, for, for having me. Uh, I'll, I'll let Chen Wu um, uh, address any other issues. Uh, I, I don't have any other issues. Yeah, and I would like to thank the, uh, Professor John Bush for this wonderful pre presentation. Uh, if, uh, does anyone have any last minute question? Thank you so much, okay. John, for taking time out of your day and being here for, to offer this great seminar. Thank you. Thanks, Wahila. Uh, all right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.